heavy, complete spoiler warning going forward. After the intro, if you're still here, you're staying at your own risk. I didn't spoil nothing in the thumbnail, so don't come at me. This is going to be a free-flowing conversation about spoilers, so it may be a little bit different in this unscripted format today. Can you believe those cameos? I, I was beside myself. First, okay, we get into the, like, finding the Wolverine montage, right? After desecrating the corpse of Logan, from Logan, which I cannot believe they did. That was gory, that was crazy. I was uncomfortable, but also it felt weirdly fitting and honoring in a way for him to be able to somehow team up with the classic Wolverine in such a darkly comedic way. Uh, crazy. And then the Wolverine montage. We started with comic accurate Wolverine where he's like so little. That was great. I almost was like, is that going to be Danny DeVito or something? I think it would have been cool had they like somehow done a Bob Hoskins Wolverine cameo since there was rumors that they wanted him to play Wolverine in the 90s. That would have been insane. And seeing all these different Wolverines, like, my wife asked me like what certain ones were. And I'm like, you know, I could be having c comic knowledge gaps here. And I think the big like him being crucified on the X was uh, probably some kind of comic cover. I loved the uh, Hulk and Wolverine moment we got. I wish that one had been longer because like the one thing we don't have that they, of course, gave a nod to in this is Hulk versus Wolverine, the Hugh Jackman Wolverine versus Hulk. I do hope we get to see that in Secret Wars if he comes back. And then they showed, they cut to that Wolverine, uh, and they showed his arms. I'm like, is that cameo true? Then they cut away. I was like, oh, maybe they couldn't get him. Then they cut back, and it's Henry Cavill. I think they called him Calvarine. And they make the joke about treating him, they will treat him better than DC ever did. And I'm like, he looks incredible. He sounded incredible. He fit the bill. Like, yeah, he's not lore accurate Wolverine being five foot three, but what a wonderful recast. I don't think he's going to be the Wolverine going forward. While I would love that, by the time an X-Men movie gets off the ground, he'll already be in his mid forties. I just don't see it happening. I think he's already too old, but seeing that nod, I think it's going to be like the John Krasinski, Reed Richards moment in Multiverse of Madness. Hey, we did it once. Here's your nod. Let's move on. But I do hope Cavill joins the Marvel Cinematic Universe at some point. But I freaked out because I'm a huge Henry Cavill fan. I was very confused where the movie was going and how it was establishing the universe. I thought at first they were trying to retcon the Deadpool movies were always in the MCU. Because suddenly he's meeting Happy Hogan. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why, how does he know what the Avengers are? What are we doing here? Why are we here has this always been in the MCU? Why have they never been mentioned? What about Colossus and all of them? This is clearly set after Deadpool 2. What is happening? And then as they're walking out, he's still wearing the time travel device uh, from Cable. And I'm like, oh, he hopped universes. He can do that? I knew he could hop timelines, but I guess they see them as timelines. Timelines and alternate universes is kind of the same thing in this. So that was just a little bit confusing because then it jumps back to his universe with a subtitle, it says like Earth 10, 0, 0, whatever. So that kind of confused me where we were, how long it had been. And this is set after Logan. Logan was set in 2029. So I'm like, what year is it supposed to be? They kind of skirt by all that. And I get it. It's messy. But I think they could have gone a little bit more out of the way and showing him. They did show like the flashes of him from the end of Deadpool 2 jumping around. But it still wasn't clear to me what was happening. And man, oh man, let's just get into the rest of the cameos, okay? Because we knew Electro was going to show up, right? We knew Pyro was in here. We knew a version of Juggernaut would be in here because uh, the actor from X-Men 3 said no, and clearly it was supposed to be him, right? We had Toad. We had A-Lady Deathstrike. You know, it was cool to see all those X-Men characters come back. And then we get Tyler Mayne as Sabretooth, marketed in those trailers as the match that people have been waiting two decades to see, and it's over instantly. Wolverine just cuts his head off. That was such a letdown. I looked at my wife, and she looked at me like, I'm sorry. I love Sabretooth. I love Wolverine. Their, their rivalry is one of the biggest parts of the character. It's never had the appropriate screen time it deserved. It's hinted at in the original X-Men, and then, of course, we get their backstory and origins, but they never brought them back. They missed the boat in doing it in Logan. And they've kind of missed the boat on doing more with it here. I get that there was a ton going on this in this movie. But I think we could have spent two or three more minutes with a fight and some dialogue between the two of them. That would have given it more weight. And maybe they were worried about action fatigue. But that's not the character you do that with. 
and it upset me a bit. However, it's immediately made up for by the arrival of Chris Evans. And, you know, as soon as they showed him, it's like, oh, Chris Evans came back. He didn't say, he said he wouldn't, but he's back. And in the back of my head, I went, huh, he's got a different hairstyle. So it's a variant, right? It's a variant of Steve Rogers. He doesn't have the blonde hair. All right, nothing crazy. Deadpool has dialogue that assumes he's Captain America, calls him Cap, and then he says he's going to say the thing. He's going to say Avengers Assemble, and he says, flame on. And I lost it. I was like, no, they didn't. Did they really just do this? And he's flying around. He fights Pyro. And I'm like, that is so cool. And then he dies. And I was like, Deadpool got him killed. That's terrible. Deadpool, I don't think anybody's claiming to be a good person. But I was like, oh, my gosh. And that becomes a whole joke and brought back at the end of the movie and him being the trash talker. It was just, it was perfect. It was dark. But it was so well done. Such a good nod and cameo there i love the little moments that they all got together we knew electro would be here we knew jennifer garner was going to come back uh the little uh dig at ben affleck and daredevil and those characters histories like i'm sorry he died and it's like it's fine it's fine <laughs> i was like oh me and my wife both laugh hearing the punisher and uh daredevil reference knowing they were there being aware there's more than one punisher like i like to think that maybe Dolph Lundgren and Thomas Jane and Ray Stevenson's Punishers were all there. But I like to think that the one they were talking about that they teamed up with was Thomas Jane's. I would have loved to have seen him in the movie. It's, it's okay that we didn't. We got enough. Because good freaking grief, when Wesley Snipes walks in as Blade, I legitimately jumped out of my seat. I couldn't believe it. I was like, they did it. They did it. They didn't save it for Secret Wars. They did it here. That was the coolest freaking moment. I was like, how will they ever top this? Who else can walk in? And, you know, we know Laura uh, X-23 is going to be in here because the last trailer Marvel put out spoiled it, which was dumb. More on that in a minute. But then they do the unthinkable gambit. Not played by Taylor Kitsch, which, you know, I would have liked to have seen him back or some kind of nod towards him. But no, they give it to Channing Tatum, who was supposed to play Gambit in a solo film that got canceled. And he was super upset about it because he was so passionate about playing the character. He has the like comic book accurate costume and the Cajun accent that, of course, is going to be hard to understand. And they make fun of that repeatedly. It's wonderful. Wonderful. You have like, okay, cool. Let's publicize Jennifer Garner's coming back. That opens up doors. Wesley Snipes blow people away. And then something nobody ever thought would happen in Shading Tatum. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And then we get the joke about the five Punishers or whatever from Deadpool. And then Wesley Snipes saying, yeah, but there's only one blade. And there's only ever going to be one blade. I was like, what's, they're, they're acknowledging the fact that Snipes owns the character so much in the troubled history Marvel this own studio is having getting that new movie off the ground. I just, wow. I was beside myself. And Ryan Reynolds made a jab at Wesley Snipes in the movie about their shared history on Blade Trinity and how they didn't get along. I, they thought of everything. They all get their like catchphrases back. Like Wesley Snipes gets the ice skating uphill comment. You know, and some people think that's, oh, that's too winky winky fan service. Listen, I get it. I think that's a fair argument. I was here for it. I was happy. It's what I wanted to see. When you're going to do a multiverse movie and you have cameos and you don't do enough with those or they just become there for shock value, looking at you, Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, these are used for appropriate story reasons. The characters want to avenge the universes that they came from, that they didn't get a chance to save. And they even say, I want my ending, which I thought that was a little like, okay, that's a little too like, they want their ending. Like, all right, maybe for Wesley Snipes, but Electra, come on. Daredevil is a little bit underrated, especially the director's cut, but the Electra movie is terrible. And they all get their moments to shine. It's not like they just show up and have a conversation. They're in a decent portion of the movie. They get phenomenal action. It was incredible. It was incredible and used so well. And it's never at the expense of Deadpool and Wolverine. If anything, it's used to reinforce the themes of the movie and what they're trying to accomplish and say what Deadpool is trying to do by saving his family, by saving the people in his world, right? And to know it's the original X-Men world at stake that we grew up with that has had the crazy continuity and knowing that basically from offhanded comments from the TVA that it's Deadpool's fault, that that continuity is crazy and they're aware of what he did, it's cool. And seeing Wolverine in costume and knowing that the costume is symbolic, he wears it to remember the X-Men that he failed. He wasn't around, he was absent, he was out getting drunk at a bar and all of them were killed and he could have maybe been there to help stop them. 
that he feels guilt from that, but he's also hated because he went on a killing spree, killing bad men who were responsible, but also there being casualties of good men along the way. The film doesn't tell you if he just straight up murdered them or if it was an accident or what, and it doesn't need to. The point is that good people died because he couldn't control himself, and he turned the whole world against the X-Men. That's a compelling backstory. When they first said that he just wasn't there to save them, I was like, I don't know if that's quite enough to justify where he is. But then they go into that about him killing people, and I was like, okay, that's pretty crazy. But I wish we could have seen some of it, or they would have spent a little bit more time in his feelings about that. Because it's really well done, and that's where Cassandra Nova is really used well as a villain to get into the characters' heads quite literally. The effects of her hands going in people's faces and stuff was very unsettling and very well done. All the CGI is remarkable, even if she's more of a throwaway villain than I kind of anticipated. Because her backstory with Charles is just glossed over. There's a couple good lines of dialogue, but she's ultimately just another typical Marvel villain used to enhance the plot. There's not much there when there could be. When Wolverine pulls up the mask, I just, that was a dream come true for me. Seeing Hugh Jackman do that. The only extra thing that you can do with him is to have him fight the Hulk. And they've crossed off just about everything on the list. And we got even a brief snippet of that. It just wasn't enough. But still, I appreciate it. Now, all the cameos of the different Deadpools didn't do as much for me in the movie. Nice pool was funny. Maybe overstayed his welcome a little bit. The dog was cool, but again, maybe a little overused. But the scene with all the other Deadpools and Peter being the thing that connects them all to like find peace, just wonderful. Wolverine wants to sacrifice himself and they have the bonding moment. I'm like, that's really emotional. And then Deadpool switches places with him. I'm like, that's incredible. And then they do the whole power of friendship thing to beat it with their healing factors. What? Why was that so good? You know? And then they all come up and the TVA is talking to them and there's like weird romantic dialogue between the TVA lady and Peter, which I thought was completely cringe. I didn't like that part at all. You know, he says, I have friends down there. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then... They get Laura out. I'm like, I assume they died when Avaloth or whatever it's called, uh, Avaloth comes down there. I thought I assume they were all dead, but they get Laura out and now she's back. But I'm like, well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. How is she in the void anyway? She's from the same timeline as Deadpool. It's established that he's in the same timeline as Logan. She talks about the events from Logan. It's not a variant. She's from the same timeline as Logan, where where Wolverine died. Did the TVA just take her from like a future point in time? But time has passed since Logan. That's why she's grown up. I'm like, how is she there? So I guess we can assume like they showed up and kidnapped Deadpool, like they showed up in the other universe and got Elektra and uh, pruned Blade and all of them, that they did it to her maybe for resisting, maybe because of him being an absolute point or whatever. Uh, anchor being is what they call it, which that was kind of cool that like once Wolverine was dead, the universe died. I'm like, that's meta and I like it. So you just have to assume that that's what happened, that they showed up, she resisted or whatever, and they pruned her as they were preparing to take out the universe. They wanted to do it little by little. He wanted to do it all at once. Who knows? Maybe they tried to recruit her like Deadpool. They don't say, and I feel like they could have cleared that up. Anyway, she's there at the end with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. I thought he was going to die or get sent back to his universe or what? Because they even say like, you know, I'll be seeing you around. And he says, probably not. And that's speaking to, I'm probably done. But he convinces him to stay. And I feel like that's saying a little bit more. And we already get the teases that Deadpool is going to play some future role in the MCU, which is obviously going to be Secret Wars. Maybe Avengers 5. Probably Secret Wars. And there's something with Thor coming. Every time Deadpool wakes up in the movie, he mentions Thor. So I'm like, are we, we're definitely getting a Thor-Deadpool team up. Are we going to get Hugh Jackman in there too? Will he come back for Secret Wars? How crazy would it be if they were to have you know, Tony Stark's Iron Man somehow come back, or like the Tom Cruise Iron Man. That would be crazy. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, Thor. Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Ryan Reynolds, Deadpool. Maybe Eric Bana, Hulk, to fight Hugh Jackman. Ah, on Battle World in Secret Wars. And then throwing Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Like, they are, could go for a multiversal Avengers. That would be absolutely insane. I don't think it's over. But then... This works so well as a send-off to the X-Men universe, and we get the good riddance song from Green Day over all the behind-the-scenes X-Men and Fox Marvel movie footage in the end, giving it the send-off they never got and granting me closure as a fan, and I just appreciated that. We had the happy ending of Days of Future Past. It was kind of spoiled by Logan and its plot. Deadpool 2 was kind of like its own thing, like maybe he changed things, who knows? And then we went out with a whimper of Dark Phoenix and New Mutants, and it's like, oh, no. We're going to give them the proper ending and give this universe a happier ending of all these people smiling and laughing around a dinner table. And I love that. I love it. 
the future of this is bright. It's got me interested in the MCU again. But this work standalone, I'm super pumped to see where they go now. But there's a specific thing as a Christian I want to talk about, and that is the recurring gag of Deadpool saying, I'm Marvel Jesus. Clearly, this is a couple things at once. This is taking the Lord's name in vain. Absolutely. This is an uncomfortable joke. Absolutely. It's cringy at best and blasphemous at worst. And they're doing it as an acknowledgement, as the easiest understanding of what a Messiah complex is, right? He says, I'm the Messiah. Like, I'm, I'm a savior. I'm going to save the MCU. I'm going to save the Marvel Universe. Therefore, I'm Marvel Jesus. And we do have Christ figures in fiction. I mean, Superman is one. All the imagery in Man of Steel, like, that's not... Out, like some people refer to him as comic book Jesus as an allegory. And I think that's what Deadpool was attempting at a surface level here. But then they use it mixed in with common cursings and sayings like the Easter saying he has risen is joked about in here and in other fl- slangs I just don't want to repeat. However, at the same time, this is intrinsically tied with the theme of Deadpool wanting to matter, wanting to mean something and wanting Deadpool to be more than just the jokes, but to actually matter as part of the X-Men universe, as a character with his own franchise, and within his own story, he wants to matter. So when he's told that he is a key to saving something, that is him expressing in his own twisted, demented way, I can matter, I can save something, instead of destroying for once. So as clumsy and ridiculous and probably offensive as it is, I see what they were trying to do. I don't, at the end of the day, like it, but I can respect the idea of them trying to take a character as non-serious as Deadpool and make him more. This trilogy has done that. They have found a way to give Deadpool heart that I've never really had in any other media that I've consumed from him. He's usually just a joke or there for laughs or comedic relief. And that's awesome. But they go too far with that. The first time would have been enough, but repeatedly saying it, come on, man, Deadpool or not. Crazy amount of spoilers, crazy hype for the future. Can't wait to see Deadpool's role going through forward. And if Hugh Jackman comes back again, They always make the joke in the movie that he's going to keep doing it until he's 90. And honestly, I hope they're right. I'm usually all for recasts, especially since they showed Henry Cavill. But other than maybe Christopher Reeve, Hugh Jackman is the most iconic comic book movie casting of all time. And they did right by him here. Ron Reynolds is up there too now. What spoilers got you the most? What did you think of the movie? Make sure you leave a comment and tell me below. And remember, always look for the good. (laughs) Thank you.